Hello, my name is Dave Emery, and this is Side One of For the Record Program Number 713, Interview with Russ Baker. This broadcast is being recorded on Memorial Day of 2010, May 31st. And once again, it is my pleasure and privilege to bring back to our airwaves Russ Baker, the author of Family of Secrets, The Bush Dynasty, America's Invisible Government, and The Hidden History of the Last 50 Years, just out in soft cover by the Bloomsbury Press. Russ, welcome back once again to our airwaves. Thank you very much. Good to be here. Uh, I'm going to uh, leave it open to you if we could begin this broadcast. We've already done two interviews, and we've talked about uh, the Bush family's operations, the networking, the synthesis of corporate and intelligence, as in uh, espionage, not intellect matters. And uh, last in the last interview, we talked about uh, the events of Dallas, Texas, November 22nd, 1963. Do you think it's even possible? Would you like to attempt to encapsulate or synopsize or otherwise make somewhat familiar to people who may not have heard those interviews, given that this is past a point impossible? Let me pull back the camera for a moment and just explain very briefly that uh, uh, the book, Family of Secrets, which uh, is a history of the Bush family, but also a history of this country of uh, events, very, very powerful, very important and formative events that are unrecorded or unknown. Uh, by the populace in general and, and really by just about everybody uh, except for the people who were involved and, and they're still keeping the secrets. Uh, and the way I came to do this book was I, I simply wondered how it was that someone as controversial and seemingly ill-equipped for the job as George W. Bush should be able to become President of the United States and the most powerful person in the world. And uh, I went about my mission uh, with no particular agenda. I did not know what I would find, and I was open to anything. Uh, and in the course of five years of research for what became Family of Secrets, uh, I discovered an endless number of uh, secrets. Uh, that's why it's in the title, uh, Secret Small and Secrets Large. And one of the things I discovered was that there was a back history to the Bush family's rise, both to the son and to the father, and moreover to, uh, uh, let's say, the power uh, uh, manifestation of certain elite circles of which they were part. Uh, and, and that really is what the book is about. And so I begin looking at the son. I discover that, uh, very importantly, the son and the father were, were much closer and more consultative than is uh, characterized in other books. And I discovered uh, that uh, the father was much more important to understanding the son. And so I began looking at the father. I discovered that the father, too, was improbable uh, to have become the most powerful person in the world. And so I began focusing first on the father. And as we discussed in the previous programs, uh, I learned that the father had what amounted to a secret life, that long before he was named CIA director uh, as a supposed neophyte, uh, that he actually had a secret past with intelligence work going back decades. And this took us then through uh, a number of traumatic episodes in U.S. history, uh, through the Cold War and up until the early 1960s, where I discovered, much to my astonishment, uh, that there was much more to the JFK assassination and the Oswald narrative than I had realized uh, or than is or than is characterized uh, in any other books. And this involved uh, the activities of a group of people surrounding and including George H.W. Bush relative to what took place in Dallas that day. And so in an earlier program, we went through the staggering array of uh, activities, deceptions, uh, incidents, and so forth uh, relating to Mr. Bush uh, and his circle and the CIA and their allies and the military and so forth. Uh, and, and this gives us a whole different understanding of what that was about. Uh, and I think that pretty much brings us up to where we are. And, uh, of course, it is said that everyone who was of the age of consciousness uh, on 11 63 knew where they were and what they were doing. Ostensibly, that does not involve George Bush, who appears to have been in Dallas, uh, certainly the night before and very possibly on that very day, but has dissembled, including dissembling apparently through his wife, Barbara. Uh, Karl von Clausewitz, the famous Prussian military theoretician, uh, discussed the achieving of victory in warfare as not only winning the war, but winning the post-war. And uh, for our purposes here, Russ, I'm going to sort of assume 
the Kennedy assassination as something of an element of warfare. And on page 118, you note that after his conviction, uh, Jack Ruby, his conviction subsequently was overturned on appeal, and uh, then he died of cancer. But uh, Jack Ruby, the assassin of alleged assassin Lee Harvey Oswald, gave an interview with reporters in which he said, among other things, as you write on page 118, the people had that had so much to gain and had such an ulterior motive for putting me in the position I'm in will never let the true facts come above board to the world. Reporter, are these people in very high positions, Jack? Ruby, yes. Uh, we might ask uh, Quibono, who benefited from this uh, assassination? And uh, in this regard, let's introduce some names to the audience, uh, Russ, that will certainly be known to, to uh, students of the Kennedy assassination and also older listeners, but perhaps not to younger people. Names like Hunt, Murkison, Meekum, Richardson, the Bass Brothers, people you refer to as the Texas Raj. How do they figure in the uh, political rise of George H.W. Bush, Poppy Bush, in the post-Camelot? Uh, well, I mean, basically, in this period, Texas was very much rising to become an independent power fiefdom in the United States, rivaling the East Coast establishment. And what you saw in Texas was a mix of uh, people who had grown up uh, poor there and had made their fortune as, uh, as, as oil wildcatters, uh, as well as another group who were a very much um, – uh, East Coasters themselves, like the Bushes, uh, and who had relocated there. Um, and in Midland, Texas, where H.W. Uh, Bush, Poppy Bush, lived for a number of years and where George W. grew up, uh, the, the streets were actually named Princeton, Yale, Harvard, and so forth, uh, indicating very much the, the provenance of so many of the wealthy people uh, who made up the, the elite in that town. Um, and But in any case, um, these great oil fortunes, the so-called independent oil men uh, in Texas, became a tremendous power center, and they exerted a huge amount of influence not just on their own members of the of Congress, but also uh, on presidents. And of course, you had Lyndon Baines Johnson, vice president from Texas, uh, and you had him, and then he became president of the United States, uh, and then we saw. Uh, George H.W. Bush and then George W. Bush. So Texas became more and more important. The other element that was going on there was the rise of a very significant uh, military industrial operation in the city of Dallas described extensively in uh, one chapter of Family of Secrets uh, and the coalescence also of a group of staunchly anti-communist uh, uh, white Russian emigres uh, in this area. And so you had all of these interests coming together, all of them, uh, uh, you know, set, set of course, upon uh, an aggressive stance uh, with the Soviets, um, uh, all of them uh, expressing a great deal of animosity for Jack and Robert Kennedy and for some of the things that they were trying to do. Uh, again, in Family of Secrets, I have an entire chapter going through some of these sorts of initiatives on the parts of the Kennedys uh, that was angering all of these various groups and, and essentially bringing them together in a powerful coalition to, to stop what they were doing. Uh, you, we, in the very first of our interviews, we talked briefly about uh, the networking between conservative Texas Democrat Lyndon Baines Johnson, of course, eventually president, and uh, George H.W. Bush, eventually vice president and president, as LBJ had become. Uh, develop that further uh, for us, if you would. The relationship between LBJ and George H.W. Bush, because uh, in the mid and, and uh, latter part of the 60s, this began to develop further before LBJ was driven from office. This is one of the many things that astonished me as I did my research for Family of Secrets was to even learn of this friendship. If you read the books on LBJ, if you read the books on H.W. Uh, Bush, there's nothing in there about that. Uh, but I learned that they were extremely close, that they shared political backers, uh, that they did each other favors. And I describe in the book how um, uh, George H.W. Bush actually hired uh, a, a judge from a small county in Texas who'd been crucial in LBJ's uh, disputed election to the presidency. They, they claimed that there was 
ballot box stuffing. Uh, George H.W. Bush actually gave this man a job in an office for his small oil company in, of all places, Medellin, Colombia. Um, but uh, there were many other things going on. Um, Brown and Root, um, a very important contractor uh, and also military contractor that was, I would say, the principal funder of LBJ's political career, also was a key funder of George H.W.'s career, uh, and very influential with both men. And I think sort of the icing on the cake, and it really tells it all, is that uh, 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 although Poppy Bush uh, was very much a, a partisan Republican and would attack uh, Johnson, and particularly Kennedy Johnson, uh, publicly, um, when Richard Nixon was elected president, and right at the time of the inauguration festivities, uh, in, of which uh, Bush was participating, he left briefly to go to the airport and to quietly say goodbye to LBJ. And this is very, very unusual to do something like that for a, an active Republican to leave the festivities for the leader of his party having been elected to the White House and to go and to, say, to see off uh, this, the leader of the opposite party. But that was an indication of how close that relationship was. And that had to do with the fact that party labels just didn't mean a lot. Uh, that uh, although Texas originally had a populist slash liberal wing uh, of the Democratic Party, very much the Democratic Party became increasingly conservative. Uh, and then you had a Republican Party, and there really was just not a huge difference between the two. Uh, one of the things, but we're going to get to, to Richard Nixon, who occupies a nice chunk of your book in a second. But you know that in 1966, uh, George H.W. Bush, Poppy Bush, was elected to Congress, and you know that he, he uh, occupied a very key position on the House Ways and Means Committee. That's something a lot of the audience may have heard of, but they don't realize its significance. Develop that for us, if you would, please, Russ. Right. Well, ways and means dealing with, with uh, taxes. Uh, uh, this was very important to the oil industry, and particularly to the so-called independent oil industry based in Texas and Oklahoma and so forth. Um, they were very concerned about protecting uh, something called the oil depletion allowance, uh, which uh, enabled them to realize tremendous profits. And so it was a high priority for them to protect that, and it was a high priority for some people, including some presidents, to look at that as a sort of a dubious giveaway. Uh, and so when, when George H.W. Bush, as a freshman, was appointed to, way, to Ways and Means, and this was almost unheard of, his father, former Senator Prescott Bush, was very influential in twisting arms and getting his son on the committee. And so what this did was this gave the oil industry uh, you know, kind of an, an inside advantage. Um, and, and that really, I think, also helped boost Bush's fortune, fortunes tremendously because he was in the catbird seat there. He was the first freshman appointed to that committee in, in something like a half a century. So this was quite a big deal. And, uh, of course, Kennedy was moving to deplete the oil depletion allowance, and that was one of many things that outraged the Texas Raj, as you allude to them. Uh, you were talking about Prescott Bush and his influence in getting uh, Poppy Bush on the House Ways and Means Committee. Uh, some of the networking, and again, a lot of people disparage the sorts of relationships that you talk about here as conspiracy theory. What you're talking about is networking, something that is at uh, the fundamental level of all power structure, really matters economic and social. Uh, networking between the Bushes, the deep networking, to coin a term, between the Bush family and someone who's going to occupy a very prominent role in our future discussions of Family of Secrets, the Bush Dynasty, America's Invisible Government, and the Hidden History of the Last 50 Years, and that is Richard Nixon. Tell us about the genesis of Richard Nixon politically and how the Bushes appear to figure in that. Well, Dave, this is another thing that astonished me. Uh, it, there are so many revelations that I came upon in my research for Family of Secrets that I started to think, my gosh, is any of our official history right? Are any of those books by those famed and you know hallowed historians right? And these great journalists are they? You know what, what is what is going on? Because 
every story that I that I had heard uh, growing up or that I had known as an adult, uh, the, the the so-called story of Watergate, the story of what happened to John F. Kennedy, uh, just on and on and on. These things turned out to be myths. And so here's another one, Richard Nixon. I began just as I, I had never intended to look at the Kennedy assassination when researching the Bush family and only really stumbling on a connection which was uh, so uh, uh, unavoidable that I had to go there. The same thing happened with Nixon. Once I established that Poppy Bush, uh, George H.W. Bush, had a background in intelligence work for many, many years. Uh, and once I established that he had this sort of secret background, uh, I was very interested in his rise to the presidency. And so I began studying that. And one of the things that struck me was how Richard Nixon had gone out of his way to help Bush. And Nixon was not prone to doing that. And um, I, I cite in Family of Secrets uh, a, a something on one of the lesser known tapes uh, where he's actually talking about Bush. And uh, he talks about the fact that um, uh, 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 he's suggesting maybe sending him on a special mission overseas. And Kissinger dismisses it and says, no, come on, he's a lightweight. And then Nixon said, yeah, yeah you're right. You're right. Uh, but Nixon clearly felt some sort of obligation that he needed to keep tasking him with things that were going to benefit him. In fact, that's also described in Family of Secrets, how uh, this was very clear to Nixon's staff uh, that he felt, he actually said at one point that he wanted to make uh, Bush the ambassador to the UN because it would be helpful to him uh, on his resume. Now that's sort of crazy on its face because presidents don't do that. They either appoint people who they think will be helpful to them uh, or advancing their policy or because they owe somebody a favor. A lot of the ambassadors are, are, are wealthy campaign contributors. But in this case he literally just said, no, I want to help this guy out. And I wondered why would he help him out and why, why would you help this particular guy out? And Nixon of all people who was so uh, 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 susceptible to whims and uh, dropping people at, 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 the, uh, at a second's notice, he, he, he remained loyal to Bobby Bush. And so I began trying to figure that out. And I, I began trying to figure out where the relationship began. And I, I ended up going back year by year by year by year until I was all the way back in 1946 at the very start of Nixon's political career. And uh, I'll just briefly sketch this, but I, I hope your listeners will take the time to uh, read that chapter in Family of Secrets, which is about particularly the past of Richard Nixon, which is missing from all of the uh, the biographies of him. And this is about how he got his start. Um, the official story that was put out was that Richard Nixon got his start as a small town uh, in a small town in California, supported by small town businessmen who were frustrated with a great liberal who was the congressman from that district, a man named Jerry Voorhees. Uh, but what I discovered was that uh, Prescott Bush and his partners in the investment banking firm of Brown Brothers Harriman were actually operating in that district at that time, gobbling up uh, defense contracting firms, uh, and were doing business with the Chandler family that were the owners of, at the time, the arch right wing Los Angeles Times, which became key sponsors of Richard Nixon's political career. But the most interesting thing I discovered was that Jerry Voorhees, it wasn't that he was a uh, so much a, a liberal on a general level, it was that Jerry Voorhees was uh, on Capitol Hill a leading light when it came to investigating uh, political influence uh, and the power of of uh, financial elites, particularly Wall Street and the insurance companies. And he was calling hearings. He was concerned this was a, in the aftermath of the Great Depression. He was concerned uh, that we did not have proper regulation uh, of these banking and, and investment interests. Uh, and his activities were of great concern and even alarm to these uh, Wall Street circles. And so you actually see in an obscure writing by Voorhees, he says that uh, uh, in 1946 he got wind of the fact that there was an investment banker from the East Coast who was in town trying to get someone to run against him. And as I point out in Family of Secrets, all the evidence points to that investment banker being none other than Prescott Bush the father of George H.W., grandfather George W. Bush. And so there you see the likelihood that the Bush family and the interests that they represented actually chose Richard Nixon, put him into politics, and basically owned him. And they owned him for decades. 
and his rise was engineered by them. The fact that he rose very quickly from the House to the Senate and very quickly from the Senate to the vice presidency uh, and then on to a presidential bid in 1960. Uh, and in Family of Secrets, in the photo gallery, which is one of the, my favorite parts of the book, you see a picture uh, of, George, uh, of, of Prescott Bush with Richard Nixon, uh, and they're wearing Panama hats, but you see Prescott Bush is toying with Nixon, and Nixon is grinning in a sort of embarrassed way, and I think that picture just about says it all, that, that uh, it wasn't Nixon telling Senator Prescott Bush what to do, it was the other way around. Uh, you also mentioned the Dresser Industries, uh, the firm that figures so prominently in the uh, concatenation stretching from Brown Brothers through Zapata Petroleum, or Zapata Offshore Petroleum, also figures in with the Chandler's relationship with Prescott Bush and, uh, and, and that milieu. Uh, tell us a little bit about what uh, Richard Nixon, you already, we've already touched on what Richard Nixon actually did for George H.W. Bush, but let's go into some detail about the political appointments that uh, that George H.W. Bush received from Richard Nixon, a man whose political destruction he ultimately helped to engineer. Well, sure, there were two different things going on. First of all, 1966, Bush gets elected to the House of Representatives, gets this prime spot on uh, Ways and Means, and by 1968, he is already wanting to be, are you ready, the Vice President of the United States. Richard Nixon, having lost uh, his bid for the presidency in 1960, is now back in 1968 as the heir apparent, likely to win, and he's picking a vice president. And in Family of Secrets, I describe this fascinating lobbying campaign where there's tremendous pressure being applied by some of the biggest corporations in America saying, Nixon, you need to put Bush on the ticket with you. And this is, again, astonishing. This isn't in the books. Uh, how and why was this going on? To take a man that, that, that very few people had heard of, had limited political skills, why would they pressure to put him on the ticket? It was very simple. It was that this guy was their man. He was working for these powerful uh, elite interests, and they wanted to be able to control Nixon. And I think there already was a sense that Nick, Nixon really, in a way, resented them. In any case, Nixon did not take their advice. Instead, he chose Spiro Agnew, and there's a wonderful uh, statement he once made where he said that he considered uh, Spiro Agnew to be uh, his insurance against assassination. And that's very interesting, although people may have taken that comment lightly. Uh, as I point out in Family of Secrets, uh, uh, Richard Nixon uh, himself was in Dallas on November 22, 1963. Very, very odd that he should have been there at all. And I go through uh, the backstory of how he came to be there, that in fact he was placed in Dallas by the head uh, of Pepsi-Cola, a man with extensive ties uh, into U.S. intelligence operations over, overseas, including uh, the effort to remove uh, Salvador Allende in Chile, uh, who was causing problems for his company. Uh, and this man was also a, a, a very good friend of the Bush family. That, by the way, is a Mr. Kendall. Go ahead. And, and so he arranged for uh, Richard Nixon to be in Dallas that day. And, of course, there's Nixon. And not only is he there, but uh, Nixon is encouraged to hold a press conference, even though he's supposedly there working for Pepsi. He's encouraged to hold a press conference. He holds a press conference, and he, he attacks uh, Kennedy uh, and Johnson. And he actually says, uh, from what I understand, uh, I know they're here today and uh, for their, you know, for their motorcade and so forth. But from what I understand, uh, before the uh, the re-election re in 1964, Kennedy is going to get rid of LBJ, drop him from the ticket. Now, this was an explosive thing to say in Texas, where uh, the, the 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 fact of having LBJ on the ticket was crucial to Kennedy and being able to gain. Uh, uh, the electoral votes of that state, which he needed in a close re-election battle, if there was going to be one. And so here was Nixon very much putting himself out there. This has been completely forgotten, but I found a newspaper clipping uh, from the day of the assassination. It was an item in the paper, Richard Nixon uh, uh, holding this, uh, I guess it was a press conference, it was a hotel room, uh, and making these statements about Kennedy and Johnson. Uh, and so and so some hours later, right after the assassination, Nixon had just returned to New York, where he was then living, and he looked like he had seen a ghost. Not only shocked, of course, about the shooting, but somehow traumatized by the fact that he himself, the man who Kennedy had uh, defeated in 1960, uh, and therefore someone with 
uh, purported animus toward the president should himself be in the city when the president was shot. And so he was just blown away by this, pardon the expression. Uh, and so years later, he makes this remark that uh, Spiro Agnew is his uh, assassination insurance. So he does not choose Poppy Bush to run with him, but instead he offers him uh, uh, a, a consolation prize pretty soon. He encourages him to run for the U.S. Senate from Texas. Uh, as I point out in Family of Secrets, Bush and his father later figure out that Nixon doesn't really want him to win, is perfectly happy working with some conservative Democrats there, and may have secretly backed the Democrat Lloyd Benson instead. Lloyd Benson uh, running to the right of Bush actually is even more conservative, though he was a Democrat. And so 1970, uh, Bush is bitter about this. He's bitter at Nixon, but Nixon comes along and says, hey, how'd you like to be the ambassador to the United Nations? Or perhaps I should say uh, Bush proposes that he be ambassador to the United Nations. Now this again is not correctly rendered in the uh, in the histories that are out there. It's presented as that it was Nixon's idea, but it was not. And actually Bush wrote a note to Nixon and said, I can be helpful to you uh, uh, as ambassador to the UN in New York. And the reason he gives, amazingly, is not because of any knowledge of foreign affairs, but he says, I can be useful to you in the social circles and the party circuit in New York. And of course, he's playing to the fact that Nixon was very insecure about his own uh, outsider status with these elites, and he knew the Bushes were very much part of that world. Whatever the reason was, he felt compelled to do it. He puts Bush into this extremely sensitive position. 1970, of course, everything is going on uh, in the Middle East, in, in, in Indochina, uh, with, uh, with, uh, the, with the Soviets, uh, with the Chinese, and on and on and on. A very sensitive and important position. Instead of choosing somebody with a lot of experience in foreign affairs, he chooses Bush, who has basically none. And uh, that gets him on the road to the presidency. So he points him to that. And then at the height of Watergate in 1973, when Nixon most needed someone he could count on, a uh, very high profile position he chooses as the chairman of the Republican National Committee, none other than George H.W. Bush. And so he's getting higher and higher visibility. He's setting himself up uh, on a path to the top. And uh, ultimately, and we'll go into this probably in the, our next interview, uh, but uh, as we see, what Richard Nixon was really doing by selecting George H.W. Bush to be head of the RNC was clasping the proverbial asp to his bosom from a professional standpoint. And also when we talk about Watergate, so many of these people track back to the Bay of Pigs thing, as Richard Nixon put it when he was expressing what he was worried about, if they went ahead and released uh, the Watergate tapes. A couple of quick notes. Mr. Kendall, ahead of PepsiCo, who helped to maneuver Richard Nixon down to Dallas, Texas on November 22nd, 1963, also very much involved with matters Cuban as well as the intelligence community because of uh, the primacy of sugar and uh, the Cuba in the sugar industry. And obviously, uh, Pepsi-Cola, Coca-Cola, got to have a lot of sugar in there. So they were not at all disinterested in uh, matters Cuban as well. Uh, one of the things that you talk about, well, you know, we've got just a little under, a little over a minute left, uh, Russ. We're going we're gonna to be talking about some of the deep networking that uh, continued that, that was taking place in this time period, and we're also going to introduce uh, how uh, George W. Bush was helping to uh, keep the skies of Texas safe from enemy attack during the Vietnam War. Uh, very quickly, uh, George Bush took a trip during the Christmas uh, break to Vietnam in 1967 with a very interesting individual. You speculate about that. We can continue on side two with this, but who is he traveling with, and what do you think he was doing there? Well, at this point, George H.W. Bush, Poppy Bush, was then a congressman, and he took with him a man named Thomas Devine. And as I report earlier in Family of Secrets, I discovered that the creation of Zapata Offshore, this early and very peculiar uh, a drilling company that looked to be an intelligence front, was created by Bush with the help of Mr. Devine, who had until just then been an officer of the Central Intelligence Agency. We have been speaking with Russ Baker, the author of Families of Secrets, The Bush Dynasty, America's Invisible Government, and the Hidden History of the Last 50 Years, just out in soft cover by the Bloomsbury Press. And if you want to know more about it, just stay tuned for side two of our interview, or better yet, go buy the book. This concludes side one of For the Record program number 713, interview with Russ Baker. This is being recorded on Memorial Day weekend, May 31st. On Memorial Day, May 31st, 
of 2010 for Russ Baker. This is Dave Emery saying thanks for listening. Hello, my name is Dave Emery, and this is side two of For the Record program number 713, Interview with Russ Baker. This is being recorded on Memorial Day, May 31st of the year 2010. Once again, it's my pleasure and privilege to bring back to our airwaves Russ Baker, the author of the landmark text, Family of Secrets, subtitled The Bush Dynasty, America's Invisible Government, and The Hidden History of the Last 50 Years. This book just out in softcover by Bloomsbury. Russ, welcome back once again to our airwaves. Thank you very much. Before we delve back into the hidden history of the last 50 years, something you've done a long way toward revealing, to those who were not aware of it. Let's tell people how and where they can get the book Family of Secrets, which really, even though we've already done a bunch of uh, interviews and we're going to do several more, I do think it could be said that we've scratched the surface, but no more than that. So. No, because Family of Secrets is about 500 and some odd pages, uh, more than a thousand footnotes, and anything that I've touched on here is literally one or two percent of what is actually in the book. Uh, it may be obtained uh, in hardcover, in paperback, and now, just now, also in Kindle as an e-book. Uh, and that's available uh, at the Amazon website. You can also get it if you go into your local bookstore. They should carry it. If they don't, they can order it for you. Uh, and you can also get it online. You get further information on the book at our website, familyofsecrets.com. All righty. Uh, this is Memorial Day, and uh, I'd like to resume with a point that we just touched on at the uh, the tail end of side two, and that is uh, we're, we're now in the mid and late 60s. Uh, the Vietnam War is raging. George Bush, the elder George Bush, as we have seen, is inextricably linked with intelligence matters, and, and a fundamental synthesis has, is presented in Family of Secrets between business matters, in particular uh, petroleum industry business matters, and intelligence matters, as in espionage and covert action, uh, the, the Bush family in many ways embodying that synthesis. Uh, tell us, once again, tell us about uh, Thomas Devine, George Bush, and their little trip to Vietnam, and what you speculate about uh, what they were doing there and what, and what they might have been uh, really up to as opposed to just uh, a junket. Uh, well, you know, why would uh, a congressman take... Uh, a, a CIA officer or a so-called former CIA officer with him, why would he take a man who supposedly had been out of the CIA for years? Uh, what was the purpose of that? And uh, as I uh, describe in Family of Secrets, uh, uh, the CIA actually provi was providing <clears throat> some kind of cover for Mr. Devine so he could go on the trip. What we see is that um, a number of individuals connected to Bush uh, and to the CIA, particularly some of these anti-Castro Cubans, uh, were now in Vietnam involved with an effort to try and um, uh, use covert operations in the villages of Vietnam to combat uh, the Viet Cong. And uh, this was the so-called pacification program. Uh, and there are indications that they may have been there to uh, to to connect with some individuals who were involved with that and to inspect how the this pacification program was going. That's a very nice word, pacification. It basically meant uh, uh, killing uh, uh, the, the people in villages who were suspected of being Viet Cong sympathizers or otherwise, uh, in some cases, and I'm not attributing this specifically to, to, to Bush or the people with him, uh, but generally uh, the, this pacification program targeted people who were suspect because they were independent figures and leadership figures in those villages. Uh, the Vietnam War, of course, was raging at this time, and a lot of young men were being sent off uh, to fight in this particular war. And again, we should uh, remember that today, as we're recording this, is Memorial Day when America remembers its fallen from foreign wars. And in, net, in, in Family of Secrets, uh, what you present is networking, networking between powerful corporate interests and the intelligence community, as we've mentioned, uh, networking between families and individuals running through generations. And right in this time period, uh, George W. Bush, the 43rd president of the United States, is presented with the same dilemma that a lot of other young men were presented with at this time, what to do about Vietnam. Uh, tell us about uh, what, what George Bush did to serve his country in this time period. 
Right. Well, so while the father, Poppy Bush, uh, was a uh, staunch supporter of the Vietnam War. His son, W., was at Yale, where he was also a supporter of the Vietnam War. Um, and the, the grandfather, Senator Prescott Bush, a supporter and so forth. Uh, and so they were in an awkward position because, uh, as has, has been documented repeatedly, uh, wealthy people have very often managed to keep their own sons out of a harm's way. And, uh, you know, we see this again and again with war. Uh, and that happened there. Uh, and so uh, instead of going to Vietnam, uh, they got W into a safe stateside unit with the Texas Air National Guard. Uh, and this story uh, is interesting for a number of reasons. It's, it's probably most uh, redolent because of uh, what happened to Dan Rather, uh, the former uh, anchorman of CBS News and correspondent for uh, 60 Minutes, when he produced this, when he uh, aired a story in, during the 2004 re-election campaign, basically questioning George W. Bush's military service record. Um, and in Family of Secrets, what I do is I explore uh, uh, Bush's service. Uh, he, he very clearly, uh, through favoritism, uh, managed to avoid going to Vietnam was placed in this unit. Again, through favoritism, he was given an opportunity to be trained to fly a plane. This was not normal because most of the people in the Air National Guard already knew how to fly planes. They'd already flown planes, and this was the reason that they were put into this very desirable uh, position. But he was brought in as with no experience, uh, sent off at great expense, uh, and taught to fly a plane by the Air Force, and then sent over to Houston to join this unit. Uh, and as I, uh, I believe, document rather substantively in Family of Secrets, although he had signed a contract to serve six years in the Air National Guard, he served only four years and basically skipped out, never finished the last two years, of course, of having later becoming President of the United States and sending uh, young Americans into harm's way uh, in an utterly elective uh, decision to invade Iraq, uh, the fact that he himself, A, didn't serve uh, on the front lines, didn't serve at all uh, over in the overseas theater, and B, when he served in a safe position, a uh, rather exciting one, flying a plane where there was no risks beyond whatever risks are entailed with flying a plane uh, domestically, uh, that he just took off and did not finish his service. Uh, and as I believe, again, I document extensively in Family of Secrets, there are indications that the paperwork was fudged uh, in order to cover for his disappearance from his unit, uh, with the indication that his father, who at the time was extremely well-connected at the highest levels, just coming in as the head of the Republican Party, uh, was very much in a position to influence that process. Uh, one of the things that you point out uh, in your book also is that uh, despite the fact that he apparently uh, reneged on uh, his stated uh, term as, in the Texas Air National Guard, uh, he sent an awful lot of National Guardsmen and women, I guess, uh, to serve in combat in Iraq, and a lot of them had not figured at all that they would be in harm's way. And well, this... not, just, not just that, but they weren't properly trained, uh, and uh, they were given uh, worse equipment and worse uh, protective armor than the regular troops. Uh, they really were sitting ducks, and they will talk about that. Members of the Guard will talk about how they never anticipated uh, fighting wars, that they didn't feel they were properly trained for it. Because typically when you join the National Guard, and these are run uh, at the state level, you tend to be involved with uh, helping keep order and, and assisting in the case of uh, emergencies. And that's what we see in, in situations like with Hurricane Katrina and what have you. But that was not the situation under George Bush, where he very, uh, without any hesitation at all, sent these people abroad into this incredibly dangerous situation, uh, including uh, members of the Texas uh, National Guard. One of the things that you, we touched on this in the first interview, and I'd like to go back to this when we actually get into the substance of W's presidency, but since it is Memorial Day, uh, you mentioned that a Texas journalist and longtime Bush family protege, Mickey Herskowitz, was helping with a puff, bi puff piece biography of George Bush, and that uh, George Bush had some interesting things uh, to say ab about uh, what he thought uh, a, a strong pre and successful president should do in the late, this is in the late 1990s, develop that for us if you would. 
Well, but, I mean, this first of all, this is a major, one of the biggest of, of, of hundreds of fairly big revelations in Family of Secrets. And I, I'm not sure whether we should uh, uh, reveal this just yet or whether we ought to save this for when we're talking about his actual presidency. Uh, uh, sequentially, um, I think that the key stuff here is about his, his guard service. Uh, my, uh, w what I discovered in terms of why he seems to have left the guard uh, and the, the indications that there was a cover-up. And this is huge because, uh, if you think about it, um, if the President of the United States just took off from the military and that was established, there is no way that either as a candidate that he could be elected as President. Uh, and once he was president, uh, there was no way he would have been reelected. So they were gravely concerned about this in 2004 when the, the Democratic nominee was John Kerry, a decorated Vietnam veteran. This was a disaster for them, the worst possible scenario. Uh, and the Bush people, have, of course, kept insisting that uh, he had finished his service, but uh, there, was, there was no evidence of that. His own officers reported that they had not seen him on the base for more than a year. Uh, when he went to Alabama to work on a political campaign, he was supposed to continue his service. Uh, they, he was reported not being seen there either. And in fact, this whole history has been rewritten. I, I quote in Family of Secrets from accounts and papers like the Washington Post where they talk about how he, he went uh, from Texas to Alabama to for a very important position on a U.S. Senate campaign where he was the deputy uh, campaign manager, and that this was the reason that he left his guard unit, but that he continued to serve uh, in the guard in Alabama. Well, the fact of the matter is he didn't continue to serve in the guard in Alabama, and in fact his position in the campaign itself was not an opportunity but an excuse. And I actually interviewed the the widow of the campaign manager, they themselves being close, having been close friends of the Bush family, and the story that she told me was that the reason George W. Bush was even in Alabama was because he had gotten in some kind of trouble back in Texas, and his father had intervened and had basically ordered him out of state and had told the campaign manager, who was a kind of a lieutenant to, to the elder Bush, to take W and keep him there, keep him basically out of sight from Texas until whatever it was had blown over. One of the things that you point out in Family of Secrets, Russ Baker, and that is that the unit, the particular unit that Bush wound up in was, I think, the 147th Fighter Wing, and it was known as the Champagne Unit. We were talking about the Texas Raj earlier. Uh, a lot of the little uh, Rajis wound up, uh, to coin a term, in that unit. Uh, again, more networking. Develop that for us, if you will. Yeah, will. I mean, this unit, uh, which was a desirable one to be in because you either got to fly planes, which was pretty cool, uh, or, or just in general stay out of Vietnam, and it was right there in the hometown of Houston, most of the people in there, not everybody, but a lot of the people in there uh, were the sons of powerful and wealthy families. There also were, I, I can't remember the number, eight or ten members of the Dallas Cowboys football team were, were put in there. So it was a kind of a, a squirrel people away type of situation. Um, and, uh, and, and so, so that, was, that was a sweet deal. And a lot of these guys lived at a particular uh, swing singles apartment complex called Chateau Dijon. And in Family of Secrets, I tell the rather entertaining story, I think, of life there at the Chateau where these guys, when they weren't uh, uh, flying their planes, were basically uh, playing pool volleyball and having barbecues and, uh, and chasing the girls. So it sure was a far cry from... Uh, uh, from hitting the Mekong Delta. Uh, yes, indeed. And uh, uh, one of the things, that I don't think that'll, that going into detail will translate very effectively into radio, but uh, both in your discussion of W's actual term in the Texas Air National Guard and in your discussion of basically what was a PSYOP in order to discredit Dan Rather and uh, also uh, John Kerry and anyone who might have brought up uh, the issue of W's service, uh, you go into a very meticulous analysis of the documents of the usual behavior of someone in the Texas Air National Guard and comparing these and analyzing them in, in great detail, which you do, I think creates a very, very, very strong uh, case for, well, really, it establishes what W was doing at that time. Right. Now, l let's think about the context here. I mean, if, in fact, all of these stories, and we talked earlier about JFK, uh, we're going to talk about Watergate, 
uh, all of these things uh, not being what we thought they were. And then we find out that the President of the United States, the man who, who started this war in Iraq and, and basically plunged the United States into a state of, 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 uh, of uh, I don't even know what to call it, but it plunged the world into a kind of newfound sort of chaos that continues today. We don't talk much about what's happening in Afghanistan and Iraq, but people are dying there every day. It's really a tragic situation. Uh, and here we are on Memorial Day, and we're not talking about this. We're, we're, we, 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 treat, we talk abstractly about our heroes and the people who served our country, but we don't talk about these other things, about the people who, who didn't serve our country or who avoided serving our country while trying to get the country into war, and often, by the way, benefiting from it. If you, if you go all the way back, uh, and I talk about this, uh, the, the Bush family was involved uh, with, with helping and fronting for munitions manufacturers all the way back to World War I, basically helping people who were, in the, in the case of World War I, prior to the U.S.'s entrance, selling weapons to both sides. I mean, th there, is a, there is a huge gap, uh, Dave, between uh, the way that American history is presented and, and, and what really goes on. And, and you talk about networks and networking, and of course, I mean, uh, all human beings try to gain advantage uh, in situations. But of course, powerful people are very, very good at gaining advantage, and they're constantly working at that. They're constantly trying to minimize risks, uh, trying to uh, suppress scandal, uh, and trying to uh, gain the informational and strategic advantage that they need to prevail. This is the way that things really work, and this is the way uh, uh, this is this is not the way that we discuss, and so uh, what you see there with the George W. Bush story with the National Guard uh, is again a far cry from what we believe. And if you go around the country, at least half of America thinks that that George W. Bush and his family that they're great Americans, that they're heroic, uh, and and you know their books are bestsellers. Uh, George W. has his memoirs coming out. Carl Rove has his book out. Laura's book out. And they are just treated as absolute heroes. And these people know nothing, and I mean nothing, about the kind of revelations uh, that I've come up with in Family of Secrets. And, and I might add, by the way, we can't get on those shows. We cannot get on to Fox News or even the mainstream shows like Meet the Press where, where these folks who are so misguided and so misinformed about what goes on in this country and how decisions are made, they can't even begin to access this information because it's, a, it's a blocked from them. Well, when one reads Family of Secrets, uh, it becomes only too clear, basically, why America's ice cream has turned to horse manure, and it, it's something we need to contemplate uh, perhaps more gravely on Memorial Day than we normally do. Really, we should do this every day, but... Uh, 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 question, Russ Baker. We talk about networking. We're talking about W's Guard Service. Uh, th again, this during the Vietnam War. Uh, he, somebody, we, we talk about networking. Somebody he met at this point, somebody who's going to figure very prominently in our discussion of the rise of W, the Saudi connections, our bus and so forth, and that is James R. Bath. Do you want to touch on him now, or do you want to say, obviously we'll talk about most of his operations yeah, I mean, later. I'm, 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 as, as you know, I'm, I'm a little leery of overwhelming people with names, because uh, what I do with Family of Secrets, and I urge people, please, when you get the book, don't skip around. Start on page one and read every page, every paragraph, every sentence, because I very carefully introduce these people and these relationships. And if you don't do it that way, it's just a big confusing thing. Um, I'll speak generally about this. Uh, uh, when George W. Bush uh, was in the National Guard, he had a good friend, uh, and that was this fellow that you referred to. And um, he, this man, uh, ends up taking on an important role in Sub Rosa uh, operations that the father Bush is involved with over the years. And these appear to be connected to Iran Contra uh, and to a pipeline involving very wealthy Saudis. Um, and and the backstory there is that in the National Guard, when Bush left, when George W. Bush left his guard unit prematurely, um, many years later, uh, when this subject came up, uh, the White House released documents showing that um, he had, Bush had failed to take his annual flight qualifying uh, exam, 
a physical exam, and then that, they said that was a minor thing, and, but because of that, he wasn't able to fly, and that's why he stopped flying. Well, that's, that's ludicrous on its face, but in any case, they also said that, that the fact that he stopped flying and didn't take his physical was not unusual. In fact, that there was a second person, and they released a redacted document where you can't see the name, but it shows that someone else around the same time also uh, stopped flying because he didn't take his physical. Now, they used that with the press quite effectively to blunt the notion that there was something really wrong with whatever George W. Bush had done. What they didn't reveal was who that other person was, and it was this James Bath, who, unlike Bush, was a great and extremely talented flyer who loved to fly. Uh, and um, what I raise is the possibility that Mr. Bath basically uh, uh, fell on his sword for Bush so that they could, when necessary, point out that there wasn't just one but two. And indeed, what we see is several years after that, Mr. Bath, a man of very, very modest means, suddenly ends up in a business where he is basically partnered with two of the wealthiest people from Saudi Arabia. Yes, last names well known to this audience, Bin Mahfouz and Bin Laden. But this, again, for uh, future discussion uh, in our, our analysis of Family of Secrets. Uh, more networking, uh, Russ Baker. You talk about it, and uh, in our next interview, we're going to get into the Watergate affair, something in which uh, George H.W. Bush figures prominently, and uh, a narrative that plays out in very different fashion than the public has been led to believe, but an individual who figured prominently, well, one of the reasons, you, you were talking about how people should not just skip around in this book, and I amen that uh, to the nth degree. When you begin studying people, whether it's James R. Bath and his networking from the Texas Air National Guard, or another individual who became known as a hero in Watergate, but who also tracks way back to, among other things, uh, the events of 11-22-63, uh, let's talk about that uh, rock of of uh, jurisprudence, Leon Jaworski, and how he figures into the narrative of uh, George Bush and some of these other people. Well, I mean, we haven't started to tell the story of Watergate yet, so I don't know how quite to do that. I can certainly give Jaworski's background, but it only becomes significant when we see what actually uh, befell Richard Nixon. All right, yeah, well, well uh, let, let, then let's defer uh, analysis of uh, of Jaworski's career to the next interview, but uh, suffice it to say that he networks with all of these individuals uh, at this particular point in time. Let's, let's in a sense, uh, sort of set the table for our next interview, which is going to talk about Watergate and, and other matters. Uh, Richard Nixon, obviously, and uh, George H.W. Bush were networking in a very significant way, and in fact, Prescott Bush appears to have been one of the people who helped to elevate Richard Nixon into politics in the first place. Uh, and although Nixon Nixon was a protege of the Eastern Establishment. He also uh, was fearful of it. Uh, Richard Nixon was beginning to alienate some of the same people that had brought him to the dance, uh, the, uh, the petroleum industry and Richard Nixon, and what began going wrong. Right. Well, actually, the, the thing that intrigued me in this regard was the similarities, not differences, but similarities between Richard Nixon and John F. Kennedy. Um, of course, much is made about their, their rivalry in 1960 and so forth. But in fact, I discovered that they actually were rather friendly. They were rather friendly in the Senate and I think uh, even liked each other to a certain extent. Um, and this is very important because we tend to look at history. Uh, we sort of use the great man theory of history. We look at these individuals and when things happen, we assume they happened because this person wanted them to happen. But really, um, there are these tremendous forces that we don't look at. And, re and what Family of Secrets is about is about these tremendous forces that are doing much more in some ways to shape our history than these individuals, these individuals being largely pawns. And so what you see with Richard Nixon is that once he gets to the top, uh, there's nowhere to go from the presidency. And so, you know, the, the, what do you do as president? What are your objectives? Well, in many cases, the objectives are to a sort of seal your legacy. And you seal your legacy by doing something noteworthy. And that usually has to be something uh, transformative, something that changes the, the, the global equation, something that secures something for the American people, whether it is uh, in the case of uh, FDR, you know, the introduction of Social Security and other such things, uh, Johnson uh, with the Great Society, Medicare and so forth. Uh, and, and so what was Richard Nixon's legacy going to be? Well, he, he couldn't have a legacy by continuing to serve the same corporate interests. And he saw that. And so he began trying to identify ways in which he could stand out. One way in which he could stand out was to be 
basically uh, uh, end some of the hostilities in the world. And, and as much as he uh, did escalate in Vietnam, that was part of an effort on his part uh, uh, described in Family of Secrets with Henry Kissinger, a dual strategy where they were attempting to get out of Vietnam. That's not to defend the way he handled it, but that's in fact what he was trying to do. He was trying to get out of Vietnam and to end that war. Uh, and he was also doing secret back-channel negotiations with the Chinese uh, and with the Soviets. And that is identical, as we now are beginning to learn, about what John F. Kennedy was doing back in 1962-63 that so alarmed these interests, the, the, the Pentagon, the military contractors, the intelligence apparatus, uh, a lot of these large corporations are very alarmed by that. And then Nixon began doing some of the same things. And so we see that uh, uh, when he gets to the top, he begins sort of shedding his handlers. He rejects George H.W. Bush as, as, a, uh, as a vice president, uh, and he begins moving very secretively. And by the way, uh, as you know, David, of course, Nixon is, is always talked about being secretive and paranoid, and that's always spoken of as if there is no context for that or that he was crazy. Uh, in fact, more and more I'm convinced that Richard Nixon's secretiveness and paranoia were entirely justified and were based on what he knew about how things really worked. Uh, let's, we're down now to our last three minutes plus on this side, the second side of this interview, and we'll talk about how, how uh, in a sense, the uh, the suckfish began abandoning the sharks who brought him to the waters and what those sharks turned around and did to him in our next talk. But you mentioned, in the same context of being paranoid, uh, something I did not know is that Nixon had attempted to get a hold of the CIA's files on Kennedy's assassination and was rebuffed. Develop that for us, if you would. Well, as I mentioned earlier, uh, he was obviously traumatized by by finding himself almost inexplicably uh, lured to to Dallas to be there the day that Kennedy was shot and it made an indelible impression on him about what can happen to people who get on the wrong side of powerful forces uh, I don't think he ever believed that it was a lone assassin uh, and the, hence his remark about uh, Spiro Agnew being his assassination insurance. And so um, he, be, he remained interested in that. And um, years later, when he was president, uh, his top advisors, Haldeman and Ehrlichman, remembered that Nixon used to always use this phrase, the Bay of Pigs thing. And he was very elliptical. He, he didn't share much with these fellows, even these guys who, who were among his most trusted. He still was afraid to tell them what he really thought or what he really knew. And so he used code words. And uh, when he talked about the Bay of Pigs thing, well, what was the thing? If it was the Bay of Pigs, he would have just said Bay of Pigs. But he said the Bay of Pigs thing. Uh, and his aides were convinced that these, that these were code words for something else something that uh, would be triggered in people's minds when you mentioned Bay of Pigs, and they felt that this was, in fact, an oblique reference to the Kennedy assassination. Now, you find very interestingly, uh, in Family of Secrets, I obtained a letter that I, I reprint part of there where he writes to Mr. Kendall of PepsiCo, who brought him to Dallas in 1963. He writes to him some years later, and he says, you know, I really want to catch up with you, and uh, I want to hear more about what you know about the Bay of Pigs thing. And this is very, very interesting. What could Mr. Kendall of PepsiCo possibly know, either about the Bay of Pigs itself uh, or about the Kennedy assassination? So that's very, very interesting. But, but pretty clearly, uh, Nixon wanted to know more about what had happened to John F. Kennedy and what was going on and about this behind-the-scenes power struggle in the United States uh, between the visible forces of democracy, being the president uh, and Congress uh, and the judiciary, and the unseen forces, these power spheres, uh, that are constantly in there trying to shape things to their own advantage. Uh, Russ, we are all out of time on this side. Just encapsulating briefly, when Nixon actually sent to the CIA to get the files on the Kennedy assassination, they told him to forget about it. And we'll talk more about the whole Bay of Pigs thing in our next interview. But we are all out of time in this side, too. Uh, for the record, program number 713, Interview with Russ Baker, author of Family of Secrets. For Russ Baker, this is Dave Emery saying thanks for listening. This on Memorial Day, May 31st of 2010.